going to talk today about in vivo gene therapy. Uh, that is directly delivering a gene to a patient in contrast to ex vivo gene therapy, such as what was referred to in the CAR T, where you engineer a cell outside the body and then uh, transplant the cell back into the body. Uh, the real challenge with in vivo gene therapy is delivering the gene. And quite frankly, for most biologics, at least in folic acid biologics, Delivery has always been the challenge. In this case, uh, we're talking about gene replacement where we'll introduce a new gene into a cell, not, so, not necessarily to fix the gene, but to introduce new genetic material and to do this efficiently. And genes are uh, pretty complicated molecules. They're different than small molecules, uh, more complex than proteins. So early in my career, actually, uh, across the river at uh, MIT, when I began my postdoc many, many years ago, uh, we began uh, to explore the possibility of using viruses as a way to transfer genes. Went through several iterations, several different families of viruses, but right around 1990 or so, we focused on a family of viruses called adeno-associated viruses as delivery vehicles, and these have become first in class in uh, the development of in vivo gene therapy in biotech and biopharm. <clears throat> it's an interesting story in the history of biomedical research because these viruses were discovered not because uh, they were isolated from an individual who was sick, uh, but they were identified as contaminants in laboratory preparations of adenoviruses. And adenoviruses are pathogenic, had been well characterized in the 60s. And in the slide you'll see in the upper right, an electron micrograph of, uh, of a prep of adenoviruses which show the large negatively stained particles and the smaller satellite particles. And there were six of these that were identified in the 60s. Uh, they were uh, referred to as AV1 through 6. And they were basically shelved because they really weren't associated with any disease, so no one was really interested in studying them. It was believed that they were pathogenic or infectious agents, at least in humans, because we had antibodies against many of these isolates, AVs 1 through 6. But in the late 80s, around 1990, um, one of these isolates called AV2 was uh, considered to be a potential carrier for genes in gene therapy. And this is an experiment that illustrates what uh, some of the potential is of uh, AAV2 for delivering genes um, in vivo. So this is an experiment in which we engineered into AV2 a gene encoding rhesus erythropoietin. Uh, and then we injected this factor into the quadriceps of a monkey uh, with the aim of engineering the muscle cells to secrete a protein, in this case, EPO. So it's a, it's a pretty twisted experiment because uh, EPO is not normally expressed from muscle cells, but, but we basically believe we can engineer any cell to express any protein. <clears throat> this is a convenient readout, as you see in this slide, because uh, we're measuring the level of serum EPO following a one-time injection of vector. These animals are not anemic. They should not have elevated EPO. And this animal, as you can tell in the green, uh, realized an increase in serum EPO that was substantially logs above uh, baseline. And we asked the question, how long will this genetic graph last by measuring blood and, and, and quantifying EPO? And uh, this lasted for 11 years <clears throat> without much decline. Um, and uh, which is the kind of performance that we were looking for in a vector in treating chronic diseases, in particular genetic diseases, is that it's incredibly durable uh, when administered into the right cell. And this was uh, uh, skeletal muscle. The animal died of un unrelated causes at that time. When I came to Penn in 1993, I teamed up with a colleague who I had met at Harvard when I was at MGH, Gene Bennett. <clears throat> who was interested in developing gene therapy for inherited forms of blindness. And this just chronicles our, our Jean's journey as we supported her uh, from the time that we began our work at Penn in 1994. And I thought it was a, uh, uh, out of the box thinking of gene therapy to treat inherited forms of blindness, but what we're able to show is a virus, a different virus, was able to transfer genes into um, retina of a mouse. We then uh, moved to a monkey, uh, now with an AAV2 vector, because we thought that it was going to perform better, more stable, less uh, uh, likely to uh, incite immune responses. And then, in a really important experiment, 
which is a theme of my talk today, uh, a large animal uh, study was done to prove the concept or de-risk uh, the technology. So there's an animal model that of, uh, of a human disease called Leber's congenital amylosis 2, uh, and in which they analyzed the same genetic defect. And Gene was able to show by injecting AV2 in the retina of this animal that the animal regained sight. And this is a picture of that famous animal called Lancelot. The blind dog can now see. And it was clear that the dog was blind before, and it was clear that the dog was blind after. Uh, no one could refute that. And with that incredibly powerful preclinical demonstration of success, really paved the way for her to move, maybe not as fast as she had hoped, but eventually moved towards a clinical trial that was published in the journal in 2008, treating patients in the same way. And these patients regained some level of function. Uh, she then partnered with a, a company in Philadelphia called Spark Therapeutics, and they moved into and through a registration trial, and they're going to file for market authorization in the United States, hopefully uh, sometime in 2017, which, if approved, would be the first approved gene therapy product uh, in the United States. Now, that story was evolving, um, and while we had demonstrated some level of efficiency of AV2 in animals, it turned out that it wasn't very efficient. A postdoc in my lab then in... Um, sometime around uh, the mid to late uh, 1900, uh, about 95, 96, uh, wanted to develop a, a form of AV that was more efficient for other targets in addition to retina. And we went back to the archives where there was first six AVs and we recovered these vials from 1970, cloned out uh, the viral genome, sequenced them, and made vectors out of them. Uh, we didn't know how they differ from one another, but we thought that they well, we knew they were different because they were characterized as being immunologically distinct, but hopefully different in a way in which may endow upon them improved performance as a vector. <clears throat> it was basically rolling the dice like you often have to do in science. And it turned out that an AV1 type vector was better than AV2 in directing genes to muscle. Uh, we then licensed that to a variety of companies, ultimately ending up in the hands of a, a, a company in, the, uh, in Amsterdam. Unicure, who together with collaborators in, in Canada, uh, wanted to evaluate uh, the potential of injecting AV into the muscle to program the muscle cells to secrete an enzyme like protein lipase that is deficient in patients uh, that have a severe hypertriglyceridemia and recurrent pancreatitis. Um, this would represent a systemic uh, delivery of a therapeutic protein through a vector. And again, a large animal model became important. The mouse was useless. Uh, it, the animal died uh, uh, in the postnatal period, uh, and, and uh, we needed, the, the field needed demonstration that this had a likelihood of success and was uh, reasonably safe. There was a cat that had a natural mutation, had the same disease, and uh, the vector was evaluated in the cat and, and, and shown to be uh, effective. They then uh, moved into the clinic, uh, and uh, showed some level of metabolic correction. It was a, a, a tough program, very, very rare disease, pioneering effort, uh, safe marginal efficacy, but eventually uh, EMA uh, granted them market authorization in November 2012 in a product called Glybera that you may have heard about. And this is the first approved gene therapy product uh, in the West. And they're now slowly rolling this out commercially. Most of the interest around this was the fact that the regulators actually approved the product. Uh, so it demonstrated uh, regulatory receptivity. So we were following that. We, that vector came out of our lab, but we were interested in, um, in many other targets and better performance of the vectors, <clears throat> such as targets that I'm going to tell you about the liver and also the central nervous system. So right around the turn of the century, we refocused my lab on developing better vectors. And the, the way in which we uh, approached this was to actually uh, try to identify from natural sources AAV beyond the first six AAVs that came out of these laboratory preps of adenovirus. So we had to identify sources of infectious AAV from primates that may or may not be infected with the virus. 
the challenge here is we don't we don't even know if this virus causes a disease. So we didn't know where what patient populations try to isolate the virus from. We assume, though, based on some in vitro work, that AAV may have a latent form of its life cycle and that all of us may be infected with AV and AV genomes are lurking about in our cells. Um, again, it was a hypothesis. Most hypotheses are wrong, but this turned out to be right in that AAV-like viruses are part of our virome that they persistently infect and are latent in our cells. And using PCR techniques, we were able to recover from monkeys, great apes, and humans uh, various different forms of AVs <clears throat> that differed from one another than anything that had been described before, characterized a family of these viruses, and then evaluated them as vectors. And over the decade, 15 years between 2001 and, and currently, we distributed these vectors to the academic community uh, and uh, based on uh, preliminary data that we had generated that suggested that they really are much better than the uh, previous six. And they become best in class uh, for in vivo gene therapy. So I just want to share with you two examples of uh, how uh, the, the new, uh, the current called uh, AV2.0 uh, uh, version of this uh, technology platform rolled out. I was always interested in liver as a target and was disappointed that AV2 wasn't going to work and AV1 wasn't going to work. One of the reasons has to do with the problem of delivery. And the fact is that these, these products or these constructs are particles. They're not diffusible drugs. If anyone calls them gene drugs, it's misleading. Um, and these viruses really do not access uh, the cells that you want to access uh, by an intravascular uh, injection because they don't effectively get across barriers of the capillary, except for the liver. And if you've ever taken histology, you may remember that the liver is unique in that the capillaries of the liver, as shown in the middle panel here, have large pores in them. So when you inject vector into the blood, it can actually get to the cells on the other side of the blood vessel, the hepatocytes. So we did an experiment with the first uh, two vectors that we had identified from a macaque, AV7 and AV8, and asked the question, do these vectors transfer genes into the liver any better than the first six? And this is an example of an injection of a vector expressing a reporter gene in mice. And the, uh, uh, and the animals are evaluated histologically at day three and day 90, uh, comparing AV8, uh, the new uh, 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 tranche of vectors that, were, that we discovered uh, from endogenous sources versus AV2 and 5. And you can see that there's a lot more blue, and there's so, so much blue that we can actually engineer most of the uh, hepatocytes. <clears throat> Translation is the key at this point of an emerging technology. How useful are animal models in predicting effectiveness in, in, in humans? I'm asked that all the time. And unfortunately, you'll never know until you do the human experiment. But uh, what we did do with AV8 is we evaluated the efficiency of gene transfer across multiple species, including mice, cats, dogs, rhesus, macaques, newborns, and uh, adults. And they all seem to translate pretty well in terms of tropism, except the dog, which seemed somewhat resistant to the vector. But at least between mice and monkeys, with respect to efficiency, uh, that looked pretty consistent and may be useful as we further develop these products. But anyway, we could go back to the to the clinic, so to speak, and reevaluate the potential of AV for targeting liver cells. And the sort of crucible in which this is always uh, assessed is uh, the disease hemophilia, which um, is an excellent for assessing diseases. One causes factor IX deficiency, the other factor eight. Patients develop spontaneous bleeds. Uh, in uh, developed countries, there's a, a standard of care now. Uh, which is protein replacement therapy, and the, uh, in, in order to prevent bleeds, children and adults receive an infusion of a recombinant protein three times a week for the rest of their life. Uh, it's a lucrative market. Uh, it's about uh, $300,000 cost of treatment per year for the life of the patient. Our notion, though, about gene therapy here <coughs> is to replace the gene. Uh, the target here would be liver. And protein replacement uh, as a substitute for protein replacement. So protein replacement uh, is uh, based on repeatedly infusing the protein. And you get a peak and you get a trough. There's a half-life to the protein. Um, 
Uh, but our, our thought is to simply take the gene encoding factor 9 of factor 8, put it in an AV vector, inject it in the blood, target liver, and potentially engineer the liver cells now to express the protein. <coughs> Again, animal models um, were important. Um, and uh, there were spontaneous uh, mutations in dogs. Uh, there were clearly mouse models, but when you're in the, in, in the early stages of bringing uh, a new platform into uh, patients, uh, it's not sufficient, uh, and it didn't prove sufficient, to demonstrate efficacy in a mouse, um, that the community needed more. And again, the dog came to the rescue, this dog, as shown here on the left, is data from a, a canine model of factor 9 deficiency that at baseline had no activity. And there's, on the, there's a log plot of uh, canine factor 9 uh, on the y-axis. We initially injected a vector based on AV2, first generation vector. And we actually were able to detect protein in the blood, which was good, but it wasn't therapeutic. The dogs still were having spontaneous bleeds. Between the time we did that experiment, uh, and uh, uh, several years later, we discovered AV8. We went back to the same dog and injected AV8, and we had a bump in expression, as we would have expected, because it was a better vector. And then we sustained protein expression for the life of the dog, and this dog died of natural causes about 11 and a half years later, with no decline, essentially curing the dog of hemophilia. Um, AV8, we then transferred under an MTA to uh, colleagues at... Uh, St. Jude's and UCL, and they produce vector in an academic setting. <clears throat> um, sometime, this must have been around 2007, 2008, when really no one was that interested in gene therapy during that period, and I tested this uh, vector in humans with factor uh, 9 deficiency, and what you see here is the level of factor 9 in red following infusion of the vector. Uh, and they were able to see an increase uh, that, in most patients, uh, uh, obviated the need for protein replacement, so they're off protein replacement. And the longest these patients have been followed, I think, is around six to six and a half years. There's a whole series of companies now chasing this down uh, using AV vectors to cure hemophilia, but this disease essentially will be cured once this is approved. So it really was three clinical data sets that was the difference in this field. In 2001 to 2009 or 2008, the field was in the toilet. No one wanted to work in the field. No one wanted to breathe. The word gene therapy, we were in a recession. Uh, but what changed this was the blind man can now see, the hemophiliac doesn't bleed, and there is market authorization for a product in Europe, and then, uh, and then the whole world changed. And I think there's a lesson here in emerging new technologies that I've learned, and that is that you really have to be careful and thoughtful about your first demonstration of proof of concept in humans so that you can do an experiment in which you can uh, determine whether this is safe and working so that any naysayer or any stakeholder uh, could not refute your claim for success. So there now are uh, a whole series of studies that are, uh, that are being published. Just this week, there were two public companies that disclosed results uh, for the use of AV in treating hemophilia B and now hemophilia A. And there are really now consistent results across multiple platforms, multiple companies, and it's a, it's a horse race who's going to be there. So I'm just going to end with one more vignette, and, and this is um, based on Another vector that was discovered in my lab, um, and this is a vector called AV9, uh, came out of the heart of a macaque. Um, and uh, this vector, when injected into the blood, has a remarkable property, unlike anything that we've ever developed, <coughs> anything I've seen, in crossing, getting across physical barriers, such as the blood-brain barrier, or capillaries of the heart, capillaries of the muscle. Uh, and this just shows uh, an example of how we think this, this, this works. <coughs> this vector, uh, postdoc in my lab, Christy Belt, was able to show, binds a ligand that's very unique. In fact, never been demonstrated to be a, a, a binding uh, receptor for any other virus. It's a glycan in which uh, the terminal sialic acids of a normal complex carbohydrate are removed and exposing galactose uh, residues 
And this vector in those terminal glycose residues has a very tight binding site, as shown in the middle here, that will bind to this receptor. And it turns out that there's a high density of these glycans on the blood side of capillaries, such as in the heart, muscle, and in the blood. So what we think is happening, although we don't know this, is that the vector then is able to uh, bind to this, uh, these receptors, and there's a shuttling or a transcytotic uh, trafficking of the vector to the other side, <coughs> which in the case of uh, the CNS uh, would be remarkable if you wanted to tug uh, target cells uh, in the central nervous system. The use of AV9 for CNS uh, gene therapy is really the emerging new field. I just want to share with you one example. And this is based on the observation made by our lab and, and others that when you inject AV9 into the blood, uh, that you can target cells of the spinal cord and the um, brain. You need a lot of vector. And some cells are more easily uh, corrected than others. Uh, but this is an example of, uh, of the most efficient target for in vivo AV9 gene therapy. This is a, a rhesus macaque, normal rhesus macaque, <laughs> that we injected high quantity of AV9 in the blood expressing GFP. The animal was then sacrificed subsequent to that and analyzed for expression of GFP, which turns the cells green. And what you see here uh, is a cross-section of a thoracic uh, spinal cord, and you can see those horns that are protruding down below, pointing to the bottom of the slide. That's the location of the, motor, uh, of the cell bodies for the motor neurons. And we can uh, correct or uh, gene transfer genes to over 90%, uh, close to all of the motor neurons of the spinal cord, uh, for an example. So this then raises the question uh, about uh, what diseases could be treatable if we could get genes into motor neurons of the spinal cord. And there are two. One is called spinal muscular atrophy, and the other is ALS. Spinal muscular atrophy is due to a genetic deficiency of a specific gene that causes an ALS-like disease, but in infants. And it is uh, really one of the most horrendous, devastating uh, uh, genetic diseases uh, that affects newborns in which, um, in which they develop progressive uh, uh, loss of muscle strength literally over months and do not survive past uh, a year and a half. And it's all due to a genetic defect in these cells that then degenerate. ALS affects the same cells, but the genes are more complicated. So this vector, uh, uh, and through one of the companies I founded, was licensed to another company called Avexis, um, and was evaluated in a phase one to gene therapy study in patients, newborns with uh, uh, spinal muscular atrophy type 1. <coughs> the clinical trial was a single intravenous injection. If you look down at the bottom of the slide, it just summarizes the clinical course of uh, SMA, that the CL, which is the, uh, it's the clinical index of disease, decreases by 1.27 points per year. In 75% of patients are dead uh, by 13.6 months of age, and they really don't survive past two years of age. There were two cohorts in this trial. This was conducted by Jerry Mandel at Nationwide that uh, was the site for the Avexis study. In cohort one, which was low dose, mean age was six months of, uh, of age of, of treatment. In the current, all those are, patients are surviving and are now mean age of 24 months. 75% should have been dead by 14 days. None of them are ventilated. And they realize actually an increase in their score from the time of gene therapy. At the high dose, there are uh, uh, a, a larger number of subjects that have been uh, dosed. And uh, they're all alive. And their increase in their scores, as you can uh, see here, actually are more substantial. <laughs> showing uh, a dose effect. So I think what we're going to see over the next year is almost an avalanche of clinical results from this new platform of AV through a variety of companies that uh, either we started or have been licensees of, uh, of, uh, of the companies that we started. Uh, and there are going to be some failures. Let's just not think because one failed, they're all going to fail, like some of the investors think. Or uh, when one uh, succeeds, everything's going to succeed. Uh, it's still science, uh, but I think we're at a point where patients are really going to benefit from this. So then this leaves the question about another emerging technology, <coughs> genome editing. 
So genome editing is different in that it's not putting a gene in, it's actually putting something in a cell to, to engineer the sequence of the endogenous genome, correcting a gene defect, knocking down a gene defect. Uh, this has been around for a while. A company called Sangamo had a technology around for quite a while. But it really became uh, quite exciting uh, when a technology called uh, CRISPR or CRISPR-Cas9 became possible, which is a, ser uh, which is a combination of, uh, of nucleases and other components. You can jam them into a vector and get them into the cell. You can uh, engineer in the cell a genetic modification. Uh, that is specific to the sequence in the cell. Um, there are a number of companies, there are publicly held companies that are preclinical, pre-revenue, over billion dollar market caps um, uh, located in the city. Um, so what, what's the future of genome editing? In terms of ex vivo approaches, where you actually use this to engineer a cell outside the body, I think there will be products that will develop. We've spent a fair amount of work uh, in trying to use our vector technology to engineer cells in vivo, <coughs> where you actually incorporate these components, give a vector, and, and engineer and correct the cell uh, in the body. Um, and this is going to be much, much uh, more difficult. The challenge from a preclinical standpoint, and this is something that would be useful for you to think about, is that the products are specific to humans because the sequences that they target are specific to human sequences. So you can't develop a product and evaluate it in an animal unless it's a macaque or a, a monkey in which you look for shared uh, homologous sequences. And here is where I think you may play a pretty important role, and that is humanizing animals. Humanizing them with respect to xenografts, humanizing them with respect to human sequences that you incorporate into the animal that we can then use as targets as we try to bring our human uh, delivery uh, a genome editing construct into the animal. So again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you today.